My name is Christy Del Castillo Hege. I'm a practicing emergency physician and a former scientist. Before becoming a physician, I studied neonatal ischemic brain injury at Brown University. I wish to present to you a case of an altered and jaundiced newborn. I will review the scientific literature on neonatal jaundice and dehydration and its effects on the newborn brain. Through this presentation, I hope to inspire independent and critical thinking on the issue of newborn jaundice and hope to change policies to help prevent tragedies related to infant feeding. I have no financial disclosures. And my targeted audience are physicians, breastfeeding advocates, lactation consultants, and parents. Let's begin. A 40-year-old newborn male is brought into the pediatric emergency room by his parents for being difficult to arouse and jaundiced. He was born at 38 weeks and six days to a first-time mother who had a normal pregnancy delivered by normal spontaneous vaginal delivery after spontaneous rupture of membranes. The APGAR scores were 8 and 9, and he weighed 8 pounds and 11 ounces at birth. The postpartum course was unremarkable and he was exclusively breastfed 20 to 30 minutes every three hours while in the hospital. The lactation consultant noted that the child appeared to be breastfeeding well. On the second day of life, he was noted to be jaundiced and a transcutaneous bilirubin was measured at 36 hours of life and found to be 8.9. The baby was producing the expected number of wet and dirty diapers. He was discharged at 48 hours of life at 5% weight loss was well appearing with normal vital signs. At day three of life, the parents had a long night of fussiness and crying, frequent feeding and not sleeping much, which the mother was told was normal and expected by the lactation consultant. At the pediatrician's office by the next morning, the baby had lost one pound and five ounces while still producing the expected number of wet and dirty diapers. It should be noted that the parents were sent home with color indicating diapers that turned green with even small amounts of urine. The pediatrician instructed they could either supplement or continue frequent breastfeeding. Jaundice was noted, but no bilirubin was checked. After another day of frequent crying and near continuous breastfeeding, the mother visited a lactation consultant. There she had a pre and post breastfeeding weight done and discovered that the child had gotten zero ML through breastfeeding. Lack of colostrum was confirmed by manual expression and pumping. Supplementation was started after this discovery. After a two ounce bottle, the child finally went to sleep. After three hours of sleeping, the parents found him unresponsive. Formula was squeezed into his mouth, which improved his mental status. Shortly after waking, he seized but remained awake after the seizure. The patient was immediately brought to the emergency room. Upon arrival, he had normal vital signs except for tachycardia. He was quiet and had his eyes open. He was jaundiced from head to toe, had poor skin turgor, and had no evidence of a cephalohematoma. He had delayed capillary refill and the rest of his exam was unremarkable. His laboratory data revealed a normal CBC in an abnormally high sodium of 157. He had a marginally low glucose of 50. His total bilirubin was 24.1. The rest of his septic, metabolic, and hemolytic labs were normal. At 102 hours of life, he met criteria for severe hyperbilirubinemia. So the diagnosis was hypernatremic dehydration, hypoglycemia, and severe hyperbilirubinemia. So what happened to this child? The combination of weight loss, hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and hypernatremia is the syndrome of starvation. What I want to emphasize to you is that hypernatremic dehydration, pathological hyperbilirubinemia, and hypoglycemia are neonatal neurological emergencies. Hypernatremic dehydration results from the inability to receive adequate fluid. The concentration of sodium occurs through the loss of free water, which results in dehydration and low blood pressure. On a cellular level, increases in serum osmolarity results in cellular contraction, which leads to increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Clinically, hypernatremia can cause brain edema, thrombosis, and hemorrhage. 
In addition, hypotensive dehydration can cause decreased cerebral perfusion and brain cell death. Non-hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia results in the inadequate intake of calories and prolonged fasting. Hypoglycemia occurs after the baby's glycogen stores have been depleted and when the body has stopped converting proteins into glucose through gluconeogenesis in order to maintain basic bodily functions. Starvation ketoacidosis ensues when all the backup stores of glucose have been depleted and ketones become the primary fuel to ensure survival. However, since the brain is an obligate glucose metabolizer and has a high metabolic demand, consciousness declines during starvation because ketones cannot meet the full metabolic requirement of the brain. Sustained hypoglycemia results in brain injury, long-term neurological disability, and epilepsy. Clinically, a hypoglycemic newborn will develop a high-pitched, inconsolable cry, constant feeding at the breast, then lethargy and inability to feed. Neonatal hyperbilirubinemia results partially from the accelerated breakdown of fetal hemoglobin at birth. However, the most common cause of pathological hyperbilirubinemia in exclusively breastfed newborns is insufficient milk intake, otherwise known as starvation jaundice. Insufficient milk intake leads to decreased excretion of bilirubin through the gut and accumulation of bilirubin in the bloodstream. It has been shown in multiple studies that the greater the weight loss of a newborn, the higher the levels of bilirubin. Severe hyperbilirubinemia can result in cernicterus, which is a form of brain injury caused by bilirubin depositing in the brain. This is minimized by phototherapy, which converts bilirubin into a form that does not cross the blood-brain barrier. While phototherapy reduces the neurotoxic effects of hyperbilirubinemia, bilirubin is primarily excreted through the gut. Therefore, the primary treatment for reducing bilirubin is in fact feeding. Hypoglycemia and hypotensive dehydration leads to failure to deliver fuel to the brain, which can result in ischemic brain injury. What is ischemic brain injury? It boils down to this one molecule. The sodium potassium ATPase pump is on every living cell in our body, including brain cells. It requires the input of fuel every second of the day. Any loss of circulation, oxygenation, or glucose delivery to the brain can result in a cascade of events that results in cell death. This is what 10 minutes of ischemia does to the brain in an animal model. The light appearance are brain cells lost due to failure to deliver fuel to the brain. Lethargy and loss of consciousness are signs of diffuse brain ischemia. Within minutes of onset, brain cells begin to die. This is what ischemic brain injury looks like in the newborn brain. The light appearance reflects brain edema and the basal ganglia. Other affected sites include the thalamus, the hippocampus, and the periventricular white matter. Neonatal ischemic brain injury causes permanent deficits in motor, language, and cognitive function. This is what hypoglycemic brain injury looks like, which is associated with injury to the white matter, followed by injury to the cerebral cortex, the basal ganglia, and thalamus. It is also associated with middle cerebral artery territory infarcts. In this study of 35 term infants, 65% of the hypoglycemic newborns developed motor, language, and cognitive impairments that were measurable by 18 months. So why did this happen? This was a healthy term newborn baby with an unremarkable delivery and hospital course. He was exclusively breastfeeding with good latch and more than adequate time nursing. He was discharged with an expected degree of weight loss and wet and dirty diaper counts. And these were educated parents who followed provider instructions and got timely follow-up. It happened because of delayed lactogenesis. Breast milk insufficiency is commonly taught to mothers in the medical community as a rare condition. However, the literature estimates that failed and delayed lactogenesis occurs to 5 and 15 percent of women respectively. In fact, a study of 280 mother-baby dyads confirmed that 22 percent of the women did not have copious milk production by 72 hours, well within the time that a newborn would run out of glucose reserves. 
That means one in five women will underfeed her exclusively breastfed child if she is not aware that failed or delayed lactogenesis can occur and that harm can result from it. This most often occurs to the babies of older, highly educated, first-time mothers who are exclusively breastfeeding. It begins with instruction to feed frequently or near continuously to stimulate milk production. If the milk does not arrive, frequent feeding leads to days of sleep deprivation, parental impairment because the baby is crying, not sleeping, and feeding constantly. A major contributing factor is the under-recognition by mothers and their providers of the possibility of insufficient milk production. The condition can be overlooked due to the over-reliance on wet and dirty diaper counts. In fact, there are no studies that correlate diaper counts with the volume of milk intake in the first three days of life. As demonstrated by this case, a child can produce the expected number of wet and dirty diapers from the fluid and meconium they are born with. Overall, failed and delayed lactogenesis are extremely high-risk conditions to the newborn baby and can cause sustained hypoglycemia, hypotension, and hypernatremia. These are comorbid conditions to starvation jaundice, which can cause permanent neurological disability. What are the risk factors for neonatal jaundice related to underfeeding? They are the following. Jaundice present within the first 24 hours or before discharge. Preterm birth, which may contribute to ineffective latch. Male babies and large babies are at risk likely because they have higher metabolic demands. Older mothers are at greater risk for failed and delayed lactogenesis. Lastly, exclusive breastfeeding with insufficient milk transfer is the most important risk factor for starvation jaundice. The risk factors for delayed lactogenesis are the following. Being a first-time mother, stress and pain, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cesarean section, prelactial feeds and delay in first breastfeeding episode, low breastfeeding frequency, polycystic ovarian syndrome, postpartum hemorrhage, and the use of hormonal contraception. Combined, the conditions that can lead to delayed lactogenesis are in fact common. The risk factors for failed lactogenesis are listed on this slide and are rare except for hypothyroidism. Any mother who has these conditions should be counseled on the possibility of insufficient milk to prevent her child from experiencing the complications of underfeeding. All in all, we cannot be certain which woman will develop failed or delayed lactogenesis, although there are many conditions that predispose a woman to developing it. More than one in five women will not produce sufficient milk by 72 hours, which can lead to complications in an exclusively breastfed newborn. The majority of the causes of lactation failure are due to medical conditions that are unrelated to a mother's commitment to breastfeeding. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine recommends frequent feeding between 8 to 12 times per day, and they recommend against routine supplementation of non-dehydrated breastfed infants. Furthermore, mothers receive adequate warnings of the risks of formula on their breastfeeding success and potential harms of giving even one bottle to their child. Yet there are no recommendations to search for whether or not a mother is actually producing any milk within the first days of life, and keeping this information from a mother prevents her from knowing whether her child is in fact getting fed. Through this protocol, a child can go days without food until it is blatantly obvious they are experiencing complications. Given what we know about ischemic brain injury, by the time the baby presents with lethargy, he would have lost thousands of brain cells. While mothers receive adequate warnings about the risks of formula, they receive no warnings about the risks of starvation to her child's life and brain. Few mothers are even aware that it is possible for a newborn to become hospitalized and suffer brain injury due to insufficient breastfeeding. Therefore, there is a blatant lack of informed consent on the risks of exclusive breastfeeding before lactogenesis, which hospitalizes thousands of newborns each year in the U.S. alone. It should be noted that although the traditional guidelines for supplementation allowed for a weight loss of up to 10%, the current AAP guidelines recommends weight loss of no greater than 7% and weight gain by day 5 of life. 
The scientific literature has shown that greater than 7% weight loss has been associated with greater risk of pathological hyperbilirubinemia, as well as hypernatremia. While this is the maximum recommended weight loss, a newborn may in fact develop pathological conditions at lower weight loss thresholds. How often does pathological weight loss occur? This is the largest study to date of weight loss in exclusively breastfed term newborns, with over 100,000 newborns studied. By the current definition of pathological weight loss, 50% of vaginally delivered newborns lost greater than the recommended 7% by 48 hours, and over 50% of cesarean delivered newborns lost 7% by 36 hours. Greater than 10% weight loss was experienced by 10% of the vaginally delivered babies and 25% of those delivered by cesarean. The limitations of the study were that they did not report on the rate of complications experienced by these newborns, namely hospital readmissions, pathological jaundice, hypoglycemia, and hypernatremia. However, from my correspondence with investigators, this study is underway. What this data shows us is that the children with the highest metabolic rates, the least effective latch, and lowest producing mothers lost 7% by 24 hours. This justifies universal twice daily weighing for newborns before lactogenesis and the establishment of effective transfer of milk documented by the onset of daily weight gain. The effects of weight loss has been repeatedly correlated with higher bilirubin levels. This study found that a weight loss of 4.5% by 24 hours and 7.6% by 48 hours predicted the development of pathological hyperbilirubinemia at a level of greater than 15. This study of a cohort of newborns showed that a weight loss of greater than 7% was also associated with developing hypernatremia as well as renal insufficiency. Jaundice was the most common presenting complaint. What would a newborn do if there were no problems with milk intake? This is a study of over 4,500 term newborns who experienced no problems with milk intake, had excellent latch, had documented successful transfer of milk, and were fed on demand. Virtually no child lost greater than 7%. If no child among 4,500 newborns who were successfully fed crossed that 7% threshold, what does that mean regarding the natural weight loss tolerance of a newborn baby? I believe it means the maximum weight loss tolerance of a newborn is 7%. This is the weight loss nomogram of that heterogeneous group of 83,000 exclusively breastfed newborns, some of whom had trouble with latch and transfer of milk, a fifth of whom had mothers who failed to lactate by 72 hours. Over 50% of these newborns develop weight loss greater than 7%. What is happening to all those newborns? Are they losing that weight because they want to or because they have to? By the way, this was the formula fed cohort and this is the exclusively breastfed cohort. The maximum weight loss experienced by formula fed newborns who were vaginally delivered and cesarean delivered were 7 and 8% respectively. What is the evolutionary advantage? Is it being fed or is it being breastfed? Why did this really happen? Starvation, jaundice, and dehydration results from the teaching that colostrum is always enough, that only a rare mother will not produce enough, that formula will make your breastfeeding relationship fail and can potentially harm your child, and that supplementation is warranted only when medically necessary as determined by your provider. Mothers and health providers are taught that a newborn's stomach is tiny and cannot hold more than a few milliliters. According to the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, these are the recommended volumes of milk per feed in the first days of life, which roughly correlates to the anatomic volume of a newborn's stomach. Yet the scientific literature studying the actual volume of the newborn stomach through ultrasound and autopsy has found that in fact the newborn stomach capacity is 20 mLs at birth. This suggests a feeding capacity of greater than 20 mLs on the first day of life if one takes into account the effects of peristalsis. 
Mothers and providers are also taught that babies do not require much colostrum due to the fact that colostrum has a higher nutritional content than formula or even mature breast milk. Yet a systematic review of the nutritional contents of breast milk through Baum calorimetry has confirmed that colostrum from mothers delivering a term baby in fact has 54 kilocalories per 100 ml, while mature milk has 66 kilocalories per 100 ml, reaching up to 77 kilocalories in the following weeks. Therefore, colostrum in fact has fewer calories than mature milk. Why does an exclusively breastfed baby lose weight? And how much colostrum does a newborn need to meet their metabolic demand? The definition of a person's daily metabolic requirement is the amount of calories and fluid required to have zero net weight change. Colostrum has 54 kilocalories per 100 ml, and a newborn requires 100 kilocalories per kilo per day. This means that the daily colostrum requirement of a newborn is 185 ml per kilo per day. Therefore, for a 3 kilo baby, the daily requirement is 555 ml, while the average mother's colostrum production on day 1 is 60 ml and 180 on day 2. This gap closes if the mother's milk arrives by day 3. The daily fluid requirement of a newborn is 100 ml per kilo per day. Therefore, that 3 kilo child requires 300 ml, yet only receives an average of 60 ml on day 1 and 180 on day 2. Another way of thinking about it is that the total blood volume of a 3 kilo newborn is 255 ml. If 8.5% of 3 kilos is 255, then losing 8.5% is equivalent to losing the total blood volume of a newborn, a volume that is routinely experienced by exclusively breastfed babies. So why does an exclusively breastfed newborn lose weight? The same reason why we all lose weight. The caloric and fluid intake from colostrum alone does not meet the metabolic demand of a newborn. The only thing that prevents an exclusively breastfed child from developing the complications of excessive weight loss is the onset of copious milk production of his mother. If a mother's milk does not arrive, supplementation is the only thing that will protect a child from developing conditions that can result in ischemic brain injury. Since the WHO published the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative recommending exclusive breastfeeding before lactogenesis in 1991, we have experienced increases in hospitalizations for complications of underfeeding, including pathological weight loss or dehydration, hypernatremia, and hyperbilirubinemia. When do we supplement? The guidelines recommend supplementation at 7%, when bilirubin levels are high due to underfeeding or hemolysis, hypoglycemia, poor feeding, lethargy, delayed production of bowel movements, hypernatremia, and delayed lactogenesis as late as three to five days after birth, often after newborns have been discharged from the hospital. In other words, we supplement often after a child has already experienced complications from underfeeding. How did we know to supplement before scales and bilirubin levels? This is how. This child is in distress and is clearly hungry. Every experienced parent knows this sound, and this is how the extended family has protected new babies born to first-time parents. This is no longer an indication to supplement unless the child has clinical and laboratory markers consistent with starvation jaundice. How did we feed babies when mothers failed to lactate before formula? We did it through wet nurses. Alternatively, the breastfeeding literature documents that the majority of newborns in countries without access to formula are bridged with alternative forms of liquid nutrition, like sugar water and ghee. 
These same articles criticize the practice citing quote-unquote perceived insufficient milk as the cause of what they believe is unnecessary supplementation, which was likely born out of the observation that babies were harmed when colostrum did not meet the baby's needs. The lactation establishment frankly denies the existence of insufficient breast milk production in its literature while watching newborns hospitalized for it every single day. What are the long-term neurological consequences of underfeeding to a newborn child? How long does it take for an underfed newborn to become hypoglycemic? No one knows, because an exclusively breastfed newborn is not considered at risk for developing hypoglycemia. While every scientific article in the known literature shows that hypoglycemia of less than 40 to 45 is associated with negative consequences in the form of brain injury and developmental delays. The current protocol on neonatal hypoglycemia is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics, screens glucose only in newborns that are small or large for gestational age, and infants of diabetic mothers. Yet an exclusively breastfed newborn who may be receiving only a tenth to a third of their daily requirement from colostrum feeding alone is not routinely screened for hypoglycemia. Furthermore, the protocol allows a glucose level 40 to 45 within the first four hours of life. Yet there is no evidence that neurons experience a change in the requirement for glucose between the fourth and fifth hours of life. In fact, a study of 94 term newborns with early brain MRI showed that the newborns who develop hypoglycemia of less than 46 milligrams per deciliter any time within the first 24 hours of life had a 3.7 fold higher odds of corticospinal tract injury on MRI and a 4.8 fold higher odds of cognitive, motor, and language delay on the Bailey scale, evident by one year of age. If experiencing a glucose of 45 milligrams per deciliter can result in brain injury already visible on MRI, what level of glucose results in no brain injury? This suggests that there may be a higher hypoglycemic threshold that is truly safe for the newborn brain. What are the consequences of hypernatremia? This study showed that 4.1% of the hospitalized newborns were hypernatremic from inadequate breastfeeding. They were all term newborns with excessive weight loss, mostly born to first time mothers. The major presenting symptoms were jaundice and poor feeding. These hypernatremic newborns develop renal failure, elevated liver enzymes, DIC, brain edema, brain hemorrhage, clot formation in the brain and iliac arteries, seizures, and two of these newborns died. What are the long-term consequences of hypernatremia? This study looked at 15 term newborns admitted for hypernatremic dehydration and evaluated their development between 3 to 24 months. They found that among the 15 patients they were able to evaluate, about half experienced developmental delays. Five were found to have moderate delay by the Bailey scale and two were severely neurologically impaired. This is a study of a cohort of newborns who experienced hyperbilirubinemia of greater than 19.9 milligrams per deciliter, a level routinely experienced by dehydrated newborns in comparison to a group of non-jaundiced newborns. They were evaluated at discharge and at ages 5, 9, 16, and 30. This study showed that the hyperbilirubinemic newborns had a 4.7 higher odds of having neurobehavioral symptoms at nine years of age relative to the non-jaundiced newborns. 45% of the hyperbilirubinemic children were found to have cognitive abnormalities in childhood and adulthood. They had lower academic achievement, were less able to complete secondary and tertiary education, they had more problems with reading, writing, and math. They had higher rates of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. And the adults had lower scores in life satisfaction and less controlled drinking. Carnicterus represents the most obvious form of brain injury, but jaundice does not have to be carnicterus in order to cause harm. Even levels routinely experienced by dehydrated newborns can have long-lasting neurological effects that persist through adulthood. 
What are we doing to our newborns? Since the 1990s, we have experienced an increase in the incidence of inadvertent starvation of newborns due to failed and delayed lactogenesis. Millions of mothers have witnessed this happen to their newborn baby in the first days of life. It is often discovered within days of its onset, but at times discovered after weeks or even months. They are known to us as breastfeeding jaundice, dehydration, and failure to thrive. The root cause of the condition for many exclusively breastfed babies is insufficient intake of milk from a mother who has reached her maximum capacity to produce. The literature claims it occurs in women who are poorly educated in breastfeeding, but in my own research it happens to the most educated in breastfeeding. It happens to labor and delivery nurses and NICU nurses, to pediatricians and ob gynes and even to lactation consultants. This is an example of one such mother who posted her story on the internet. So my milk did eventually come in after a few days, but then Bradley would still sleep most of the time, so I thought he was getting what he needed. Then we noticed he was nursing for hours on one breast, and either he cried afterwards, seeming unsatisfied, or he would just fall asleep. I asked if it was normal that he nursed for so long, and they said he must be going through a growth spurt, and that he was hungrier than usual. Then he was still yellow, and he probably got a little sunburned because he made sure he got enough sun to get rid of his jaundice. He wasn't getting the bilirubin out of his system. His poop was still green and never turned yellow as it should. It could have been from a four-milk hind milk imbalance, so I nursed him longer on each breast instead of switching too soon. Then his weight began to drop. We lost his chipmunk cheeks, and he looked like a wrinkly old man when he cried. His birth weight was 2.8 kilos, and after a month, he weighed 2.2 kilos. It crushed me. I held him in my arms at night, locked our bedroom door, and cried out to God. What can we do about this? There is a large body of literature that can inform policy to prevent starvation jaundice. A study of the Utah health system over a 10-year period showed that 1.79% of babies were readmitted within the first weeks of life, the majority of whom were admitted for jaundice and feeding problems. Therefore, in the U.S. alone, approximately 54,000 babies are admitted every year for jaundice and feeding-related problems. In this study conducted the Northern California Kaiser Permanente System, the highest risk factor for rehospitalization for dehydration is a length of stay of less than 48 hours, particularly among cesarean births. The second highest risk factor was exclusive breastfeeding, which yields an 11-fold higher odds of being readmitted. The remaining risk factors are being born to a first-time mother, mothers of advanced maternal age, and being less than 39 weeks gestation. Exclusively breastfed newborns who are discharged by 48 hours before the onset of copious milk production are being sent home without a certain source of food. If a mother's milk does not arrive, a child is likely to be readmitted if a mother is not given the license to supplement at home. In this study, adherence to the AAP follow-up guidelines did not decrease the risk of readmission because the guidelines allow for follow-up of up to 48 hours after discharge of a high-risk infant well within the time that a child can develop complications from underfeeding. Nearly every case of starvation jaundice can be prevented with education, monitoring, and supplementation. Feeding is more important than breastfeeding. Because a child's brain only knows the presence or absence of oxygen, fluid, and calories, Minutes of loss of fuel delivery to the brain can result in irreversible brain injury. We need to identify risk factors for starvation, jaundice, and breast milk insufficiency in mother-baby dyads who are exclusively breastfeeding. All mothers should be given thorough counseling and informed consent on the risks of underfeeding. We need to calculate the 7% weight loss limit at birth, which can be provided to the mother and posted in her room. Exclusively breastfed newborns should be weighed twice daily in the hospital and at home to prevent greater than 7% weight loss until lactogenesis and successful transfer of milk is established as documented by the onset of daily weight gain. 
mothers need education not only on correct latch and positioning, but also on listening for the sounds of swallowing, as well as pumping and manual expression of milk to determine the presence of colostrum in the first days of life. Test weights can be performed to determine the volume of milk transferred to the baby during a feeding. Exclusively breastfed babies deserve daily transcutaneous bilirubin and glucose checks, which are critical labs necessary to prevent brain injury. The clinical exam does not sufficiently predict the presence or level of hyperbilirubinemia and hypoglycemia. Newborns can be monitored at home with home scales weekly than monthly to prevent failure to thrive. Finally, mothers need permission, support, and validation to supplement babies in distress or reaching a weight loss of greater than 7%. Supplementation can occur after nursing sessions or with a supplemental nursing system to continue stimulation of milk production. Finally, we need research on the neurological consequences of weight loss in the newborn period. We have no data on the long-term neurological consequences of losing 10% over 10 days or even 7% over 5 days. We need to research the lowest weight loss limit that is in fact safe for all newborns. It is a mother's right to know the risks and benefits of the decision she makes regarding the health of her baby. Any failure to provide full informed consent makes a provider liable for the negative consequences that result from that failure. Mothers are being led to believe that there are no risks to exclusive breastfeeding before lactogenesis while a baby gets admitted for feeding related complications every minute of every day, several per week in every pediatric ICU. The newborn baby is the only one who knows their tolerance for weight loss and their cries of hunger have been muted by breastfeeding education and a health system that denies the meaning of that cry. It is a basic human right to be fed what you need to meet your physiologic needs. Mothers have been pressured to not meet those needs by the standards we have set about what constitutes ideal feeding. They are turned away for their concerns about their babies not getting enough and made to sign waivers that suggest they have failed as parents. The babies of mothers whose bodies cannot produce enough milk pay the price. Then their mothers are silenced by lies about how rare they are for not producing milk and shamed into silence for harming their own children. We as a healthcare system do not listen. We need to listen to mothers and their babies when they say there is not enough milk because they are telling the truth. Not feeding a child enough milk kills brain cells and leads to lifelong disability. On this Facebook page are the voices of thousands of mothers, many of whom have the same story. This newborn was my child and I am that mother. It can happen to any mother and child, and every single one of these stories can be prevented.